Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, I have a photo of Michael Mann. How is that? Did so, you break into his house and take his physical photos? Is, is it a digital photo? Like, how is this possible? I don't know, actually. It's, <laughs> believe it or not, the best coverage on this is from the Daily Mail in the UK. They have an exclusive article, quote, unmasked. The My Payroll HR CEO who stiffed thousands out of their salaries is finally pictured as worker tells how crude forgery sent the, quote, Warren Buffett, unquote, of Clifton Park into collapse. But it's not even a real photo, right? It is a cell phone video of some training they were doing at work, possibly. On Something a, like on that. On a cell phone. And then they, they screen grabbed that. So there's still not like a real like photo on the internet of this guy. Like he never did a selfie. Yeah. And our listeners, of course, can't see the picture that we're looking at. So I'll do my best to describe Michael Mann. You know who he looks like to me? He looks like Jason Biggs from uh, the guy who played Jim in American Pie. Oh, like when he's 50 years old? and Yeah, like when he's, he's older. Pounds on him. Yeah. Oh, I can like see that. He's going to play him in the TV movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, so we, we now know what he looks like. So that that's that's it. If you'd like to see that picture, it's in the show notes. And you can watch the video too. They were obviously like role-playing something. Like maybe it was a training for other employees. Like there was supposedly a meeting at My Peril HR. But if you listen to the audio, it's like this weird interaction between him and this other person. And I think there was like a creating a fake scenario. They were acting. Oh, weird. I didn't uh, actually, I didn't realize it was a video. So <laughs> I'll have to go watch that now. Yeah. That's great. The audio is really hard. It's really hard to hear, but um, it's worth checking out. And then they have a nice little map about it. And the, and, and the Daily Mail is really sensationalizing this. It's Michael Mann's coast to coast empire. And it has little logos and, and it shows I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve 12 different cities that are all tied into this. So it's worth uh, yeah, checking I'm just, out. I'm just amazed that like the readership of the Daily Mail in the UK is that interested in this, following this. It's like, I don't know, is this the is this our royal family here? In the U.S., right? Is this is this dirt really that interesting? I was actually surprised. Like, did, does the Daily Mail just happen to have somebody that was in Clifton Park? Like, it, it just really surprised too as well. Like, how is the Daily Mail all over this? I mean, um, they did, they, they sent somebody to his house. I think they, they videotaped the FBI raid. <laughs> like, they were there for that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the Daily Mail is a front by the FBI. I, who knows? All right. That's Any, enough of anyway, that. But that you, is not. There's a picture. Finally, that is not the really big news we want to talk about today. There actually is some really big news. And I'm going to let you talk about that, David. All right. Well, one part of the news is we don't have any reviews to read this week, Blake. Oh, well, we get zero reviews. I mean, it was a busy week. It was uh, October 15th, not that long ago. So people are resting and relaxing after the deadline, the tax deadline. All right, all right, that's all my, right, okay, okay. that's how I, that's how I, I make myself feel better about it. I think I saw a video on the on the the socials. Um, it might have been EY. I'm not even sure which of the big four it was, but there was a fire alarm in the building, uh -huh. and everybody was like outside holding the laptops because they could still get some Wi-Fi. <laughs> and they're working. People's returns. It was they were working. Yeah, they're outside and at the front. That's town awesome. Town. Good for them. You know, that's that's hardcore. Well, let's talk about Square. Square, yes. So, I mean, we've been saying it. Hey, if Square ever makes a GL, it's it's a game changer. Yeah. Well, right? and the background on all this for our listeners is that Square just seems to be releasing crazy amounts of features all the time, time tracking. They just added restaurant capabilities. You can now run your restaurant on Square. Like what else? Uh, payroll. payroll. They have appointment setting, you know, if you're a salon. Yeah, they're adding like they're they're going out of from, from starting with just like a little payment taker, uh, point of sale, like building out an entire point of sale, building out all these business features. Like it's a whole business. Management. Marketing automation tools. Yeah. Like Everything you need to do to run your business, they do, except for a GL. So David, you and I have been speculating for a while now, hey, well, when are they going to build accounting software, right? So that's the big news today that you've, you yeah. found a post on their developer site? Yeah. So it's a post on their developer's blog. And I have to give credit to uh, Annie Terry, who uh, texted this over to me. She actually uh, came across it, I think, from somebody on Twitter. Hi, Annie. Before we read this, let's re uh, rewind a little bit or talk about this. So if you work backwards, so... Jack uh, Dorsey, mm -hmm. who started Square, started Twitter. And when Twitter was started, it was kind of in this new era of Web 2.0, right? And companies started thinking about things differently. Instead of just building a website or building an app, right? You would build your APIs first, and then you would build your product offering on top of those APIs. Gotcha. And I think this is something you've probably heard like QuickBooks talk about going forward. They're kind of rewriting some parts of QuickBooks online. I think maybe possibly Zero has, has talked about this as mm -hmm. well. Instead of creating your APIs after the fact, 
you build on top of your own API. So that way, all developers, your own engineers, your right. whole product runs on the same technical technology stack. And, right? that's, and that's how they built Twitter. Yeah, that, and that's truly a platform when you think about it, right? The idea of a platform is that it's a something you build apps on top of. So you build your platform, then you build your own app on top of it. And it's super, when you do that, it's super scalable, right? You're not having this weird, like, oh, somebody added a feature to QuickBooks and there's a ripple effect to a developer because right. it's not in the API versus the API is built first. And then as soon as something's added to QuickBooks for the whole world, all the developers can get to it gotcha. too. Right? Okay. So that's the background. And that's why people are, that's the background, right? So going by that same logic, there's a blog post on the developer blog from Square and they they call it books. So this is a blog post announcing a new service called Square Books. And, and it's not even um I don't know if it's as much an announcement as it's a kind of a behind the scenes nerdy engineering look of how Square is doing something. And and the full title by the way, which really caught my attention is Books, comma an immutable double entry accounting database service tracking financial transactions at scale. And so our listeners could actually go read this article because it's not as um, technical from a nerdy perspective. It's really almost like an accounting 101 class and how Square now has APIs and they are solving and tracking things in a double entry bookkeeping system at the API level. It describes the problem they had, which is they originally started out tracking transactions as a in a non-double entry way, listing out transactions in a ledger and... Of course. It's like using Quicken. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> or, you know, how merchants in, you know, the Renaissance track things before the invention of double entry accounting, right? And there are obviously problems with that. Yes, yes. So, so basically, I, it's funny too, like this is one of those themes where, you know, developers encounter problems that humanity has already solved for hundreds of years, but they think that they're the first people to ever solve it. <laughs> so... They had to come up with doing this in a double entry way. No, they, I mean, they obviously like look. Well, he, he actually uh, talks – he has a sentence in here which is really, really great. I actually I like uh, because you're right. Most engineers over-engineer stuff. They reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And, and so he's talking about this and he gets to a point in the article and he's like, to address consistency, we picked a well-established public domain battle-tested approach to moder modeling financials that enables all of our properties – colon, double entry accounting. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it's really well, well played. On and that. so there's all these screenshots showing how their database changes when they move from a single entry record keeping system to a double entry record keeping system, which really when you get down to it, what they're doing, it seems like is recreating in a better way, in a public way, what banks do. This goes straight to your argument, David, that Square is becoming a bank because now they have built, as part of their platform, the record-keeping system that they need to be one. They're currently using this double-entry system to track their payments, refunds, pending balances, and payouts, but they could easily use it to track customer account balances. Well, and actually, that they are doing that because your Square balance that you have with them that they owe you, that's like an account. Right, it's only it's only a small stretch for that to become a bank account. I mean, Square just has to create a banking entity, and they could do it, right? And they have, you know, they, they have ent uh, transaction entities, journal entries. Right. A developer can. There's a journal entry API call. So somebody, if they make this public, like if 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 I can use their SquareBooks database now as a developer, I could build a double entry accounting system inside Square or leveraging Square. And Square could do it themselves. Yeah, I think there's, I think yeah, there's kind of this GL is the GL is a commodity. GL is a service. That's one way to yeah. think about this a service, right? But I think the the bigger impact is a. You're right. It lays the groundwork for them to become a bank, but it also lays the groundwork for them to slap a UI on top of this. And now this is a very, 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 very serious competitor to QuickBooks and Zero. Yeah, like very, very, well, very. Well, because well think about it. Yeah, you sign up as a competitor. as a small business. You sign up. What's what's the first pain point you have? It's not, I need to do my accounting. It's, I need paid. to get paid, right? So if now your payment service provider, your swiper can do your accounting, why wouldn't you just sign up? Because they're going to import all your transactions correctly coded. There's no, right? The, 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 so much of bookkeeping is just making sure that the transactions get in from that point of sale into the accounting system properly with batches and stuff. But Square could just do it automatically. It's almost hard to believe they wouldn't do it. You heard it here first. There's no doubt. 
Square is getting into this game. Yeah. It's very, very clear, especially if you follow history of Twitter at all. Like, there's no way they don't get into this game. And, and if you really follow Twitter, they'll do it. That's what Twitter did. Their APIs were totally wide open at first, and they they let a bunch of other people build crazy. I remember my first three years on Twitter, I never actually used Twitter. I was using everybody else's products, right. right? That used Twitter under the covers. And then eventually Twitter kind of started blocking some of the API access and then made everybody use Twitter and that started getting all the good features like retweets and things like that. Now, I, I don't and know if you could see the same strategy. Yeah, but I don't know if that'll ha- So that happened with Twitter because they needed the advertising. So you had, to, they had to have people on their app to sell ads. They couldn't, they hadn't figured out how to do that through the API, right? Maybe if they'd figured out how to do it through the API, we'd still have all these different apps. But so they they acquired like Tweetbot, I think, is when they acquired, right? So they acquired the tech they didn't have to make the app better, and then they forced everyone to use it. But I think that Square, if they really think about it, could decide to let people build GLs on top of Square that leverage Square's payments because that's where Square makes the money. Yeah, and they've been all the pushing all their other products right. as well through their UI. So this is going to be like this is coming. There's no doubt. That's the next announcement from Square is say, hey, we have a UI. Because um, certainly they, they they already have 220 terabytes of data in this system. So they've been using it. And uh, the interesting thing is a small team of three people. So this was a very uh, a big brag by uh, the engineer here. <laughs> um, it's, but this is, a, this is major, yeah. major, major news that I think there's been one tweet about this. Well, one. and because it's on the developer blog, right, which people don't pay attention to. Uh, only only developers, developers do. The, so on the other side... The non-developer blog, the mainstream blog, there was a giant release this week as well. I think it was this week. They released Square for restaurants. So now you can use Square to, you know, not, you don't have to have a separate system for managing all your, you know, restaurant stuff. You can just use Square for that. So like Square, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like they've been mostly used for like cafes or small shops like retail uh, but you couldn't use it to manage like a full service restaurant yeah and that's where people would make that jump from square to a product like revel point exactly sale, which which is really good for, for restaurants so yeah they've now they're attacking them they're yeah square's attacking a lot of people in a lot of different fronts wait staff can place orders with conversational ordering there's employee management built in uh, staff performance and time tracking tip splitting fraud protection you can make changes to the menu on the fly you can customize and preview exactly how your menu appears on the point of sale. You can customize your workflows. So you could select different items to straight fire automatically. I assume that's terminology in the restaurant industry. Oh, and they integrate with Caviar, which is the Square-owned meal delivery service. So now you don't have to have like a separate service to accept delivery. You can just use Caviar or tell your customers to use Caviar. That was the big release on the product side. Then there was a smaller announcement called Square Assistant. It's an AI. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, an yep. AI powered automated messaging tool from Square Appointments. So this is part of Square Appointments, an existing app that's part of the Square ecosystem. It allows customers to respond directly to SMS appointment reminders to confirm, cancel, or change their appointment. It automatically replies to customers and handles all coordination around bookings without any action needed from you. That's cool. And there's a picture showing how it works with a customer getting the confirmation and then replying saying, oh, I need to cancel or reschedule and it doing it all for you. That That's another example of something that is hugely valuable to the business owner, way more than accounting. And Square built that first, and then they can build on all the other stuff, right? And and we're going to be naturally funneled to it as customers because we're already in their ecosystem. And I think uh, five, six years ago, you know, back when I was younger and I, and, uh, I made the 40 under 40 list, like, like the was it was – one of the questions I think was, you know, what is going to be the biggest challenge for accounts and bookkeepers in the future? And an argument I've been making for years is you are not part of the conversation. Like if you go back 15 years ago, somebody would start a business on day one, day two, they would go to Office Depot and buy QuickBooks. Right. Day three, they go find an accountant or vice versa, right? Now they're buying on their phone, they're setting up their whole business. They're getting a swipe, uh, a square type product, right? They're receiving payments, they're setting up appointments, they're using all these apps. And the bookkeeping part is six months down the road. Right. Like you're not even in the conversation. And that is Square's complete proof of that, right? It's it's everything else. The, they're solving all the business owners' problems, except for bookkeeping. But obviously now, we just learned that 
they're, they're going to attack that as yeah. well. So that's what we need to be thinking about is, right, as accountants is how do we stay uh, in part of the conversation or what markets do we serve where we are still part of that conversation? Because there definitely are ones where, you know, accountants are part of the conversation. Although I could, I could, I think I could make a counter argument, David, that, that accountants have been sidelined from that conversation ever since QuickBooks came out in a lot of ways. Because QuickBooks was that first software where instead of the business owner going to the accountant to say, all right, I need to you know, get set up and do accounting, they would just go to Office Depot and buy QuickBooks and start without the accountant. Yeah, it was probably the, the scratch of that surface. It was sure. the beginning of it. Uh, but it's not, I don't think it's as easy, like literally somebody in their car with their phone. Right. Like now, now it's that easy to do. So, yeah. so really, what, you know, what had happened is then bookkeepers and accountants started supporting QuickBooks and became pro advisors, right? So it was this, um, it was that it was business owner goes buys QuickBooks, runs into trouble, needs help, goes and gets the pro advisor, and that's the relation how the relationship forms. With this, I mean, there'd be certainly be a similar thing, so, right? As soon as Square GL comes out or Square Books like rolls out whatever their accounting software, Square Accounting, then you want to jump on that as a, an accountant so that you can serve all those new customers. There's no reason as an accountant or bookkeeper, you can't have Square as your niche. Like I am, I only support the Square stack, tech stack, and only take clients on Square across the board. Yeah, especially in, in the Square niche, right? Like, so Square, I only serve restaurants that are using Square or something like that. Yeah, yep. cool. Absolutely. All right, enough about that. So I have, a, yeah, I have an article that I cut last week. Now an article this week, maybe bring it back. Okay. So- so last week, it was an opt-ed article I saw that I thought was just interesting, but we had too much other news, so we didn't catch it. So the title of the article is, We're Losing Control of Our Computers, right? And if and really, back in the day, you could buy a computer. You could install any software you want on that computer anywhere you get the software, mm -hmm. right? CD-ROMs, download from anywhere on the globe. Well, Mac and the new Mac OS, right? They have announced they're not going to let you install software if you don't get it from the uh, Apple Store. So, Blake, if you we're an engineer and you wrote your own little teeny bit of software and you wanted to run it on your own computer that you own. You can't do that. Uh, yeah. So, this, but this has been a thing for a little while with Max in that if I, I actually had this happen where recently um, if I download something, not from the Apple store or the app store, I should say, I have to do a little workaround. I have to do a key combination and, and, you know, click a sub menu to open the app and get around it not being from the app store. And the idea is we don't want less sophisticated users to download malware. But, so you have to be a power user and know what you're doing in order to open that app. Yeah. But apparently like they've gone, they're going even more extreme than that now. Like you want to be able to do those types of things. And this ties back in this article talks about how Adobe in Venezuela canceled all the, all the people that are using um, Adobe's cloud product. They just canceled all their accounts. So you just can't use it anymore just because you're in Venezuela. And so you just don't have control over this. Right. Now, to tie it back to our industry, this episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. Many times when choosing a payroll service, you have to choose between a new startup with a great app or an established company whose tech may feel a little behind the times. With OnPay, you get the best of both worlds. A great app from an established company that's providing payroll for over 30 years in all 50 states. OnPay is an easy-to-use, full-service payroll with simple, straightforward pricing, and it includes all their features. Employee self-onboarding, HR tools, health insurance, workers' comp tracking, and 401k. And with an accountant's dashboard and partner program, combined with best-in-class integrations with Zero and QuickBooks, OnPay is the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. They also handle all the complicated stuff that other payroll providers don't, like agricultural payrolls, including Form 943, multi-state payrolls, and employees with H-2A visas. I'm really excited to tell you that OnPay is offering an exclusive promo code only for the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast to get three free months of OnPay payroll service for any of your clients that you set up by February of 2020. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash onpay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. And use code CAP3FREE when you sign up your clients. That is CAP, the number three, F-R-E-E. -E. And to be clear, you cannot get this promo anywhere else. It's only available to the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Um, Reckon. So is, are people familiar with Reckon? Are you familiar with Reckon? Uh, a little bit. So Reckon essentially is the third-party provider that in a way like branded QuickBooks 
right in the Australian market. Right. They they were yeah they were QuickBooks in Australia essentially yes. Um, and so it was a separate company, but it was almost like a, a development deal type of thing. And you used to be able to just buy it. And then if you had to reinstall it, you could call and get it reactivated and get a new key code to install it. Like all that desktop software was kind of key code driven, right? And you have to activate your your subscription. Um, And what they're doing now is they're just shutting people off. They're deactivating their keys and you can call call them and you got to buy a new key Hmm. and a new version. You've lost, like they're forcing people to, because Reckon's a little desperate, I think. They're not competing, obviously, with the zeros of the world, right? In Australia. And they're basically... Well, they are you kind of are you? They're playing dirty. Well, they, like, you know, they like, have to move to a subscription model because that's where everything's headed, right? So the only way to do that is by requiring people to upgrade. Well, yeah, going forward, but to turn off something they already paid for. Did they? I mean, that, that seems yeah. Like, that, that that that's the problem. That that that's the problem. It's crossing. Well, line. they paid for, but technically, when you you know pay for software, you don't own it. You're just licensing it, right? That's why it's called a software license, even if it's installed on your computer. So this is really an issue of like consumers or businesses not really understanding what they agreed to in the past. You thought that when you bought that CD, you were the, buying the, the software. The, you're not. The industry standard is usually okay. You bought it. And you can continue yeah. to use it. You, maybe we won't give you tech support. Yeah. Sorry. You don't, we're not going to support it anymore. But if your computer still runs it, you still got the disk, you still want to use it, more power to you. But what they're doing is they're disabling existing situations out there. And that's really not okay. Well, here's a great example of that in the US. Did we ta- not talk about this? Um, QuickBooks announced that they are no longer going to support payroll in the desktop product after what early in 2020. Did you hear about this? I did see that, and I, you know, we have so many articles, and then sometimes things fall off yeah. the radar. Yes, I, 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 that they're getting out of the QuickBooks desktop payroll. So game. basically, all these people who bought QuickBooks desktop, who payroll is part of that product, right? They paid for it. Now they are no longer going to be able to keep using desktop with the integrated payroll. They're going to have to either use what one of the other Intuit payroll products that's online and then sync their data into desktop or do, I don't even know if you can do that. Maybe do manual well, entries or they have well, payroll on QuickBooks desktop was always, you got it, but if you wanted it to calculate things, you had to pay for the tax table. And so I don't but know. Now you can't even do article, that anymore, right? That I did not see. I, I didn't, I, I feel like I saw that as a headline. I never actually saw any article about it. Like maybe I saw it on social media possibly. And that's why I just saw a tweet or a Facebook post about it. But in theory, the the tech's still there. But the, well, I mean, it's useless it's if you have to do your own calculations. Nobody's well, going to do that. Amazed. No, you'd be amazed. I was on the payroll team at Intuit and it was maddening. People manually, to avoid spending $100 a year on getting, and this is, I'm going back, mm-hmm. you know, a decade ago. People would every week manually calculate paychecks to avoid spending $100 Jeez. a year on tax tables. Hundreds of thousands of people every week would do that to avoid paying for a tax table. So, uh, yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll do some research mm-hmm. um, over the next week and see if I can find an article or this. But I did see the announcement. Now that you bring it up, I, I have no clue about it though. All right. Well, we'll f- figure that out and then get back to you on that. Uh so since we that was enough about desktop. So software. since we just talked about QuickBooks, let's talk about Zero and their latest release. Uh, we haven't covered that yet. So HubDoc, a Zero owned product, now has more sophisticated permissions for users. So business owners can control who can access their documents by assigning user roles, which they apparently didn't have before. So there's three types of user roles that include upload only, standard, or accountant slash bookkeeper. And the difference between standard and accountant slash bookkeeper is what I'm really interested in. So standard users can upload documents, view and download, manage the organization's settings, and then optionally publish documents to the GL, manage automated connections, or manage other users. Those are optional. And then the accountant bookkeeper can do everything that you know the users currently can. So I guess the idea is let's let's create a user type that can't manage all the other users and and where we can control whether or not they're publishing to the GL. Uh, so that's the HubDoc update. And then the only other thing that was really interesting, I don't know if this is really news to a lot of people, but they've changed the way that they're integrating with Stripe. So now you can create your Stripe account as a bank account 
in zero and you connect it. Speaking of Stripe becoming a bank or Square becoming a bank, it actually looks like a bank account now in zero and you can connect to it like it's a bank and then all the transactions import every day. And you can reconcile those. Whether or not you're using Stripe as a payment service on your invoices in zero. So it's really neat. And then you can set up bank rules, of course, and then any transfers to your bank account work like transfers between the accounts in zero. And then you can also now do auto pay on credit card invoices with Stripe in zero. So you set up a repeating invoice, you offer auto pay, and then once that is set up, it just goes every single repeating period, whatever that is. And that's it for the zero updates. What else is new? Uh, there's a bill.com announcement. Yeah, big one. About how they're moving into mid-market. Yeah, they are now doing purchase orders. They're going to sync purchase orders from Oracle NetSuite and Sage Intact and other partners and then allow you to match up those POs with bills on one screen in bill.com and route for approval. And this is big because this is one of those things that's really been missing for the mid-market for bill.com. I think for me, the takeaway was that they're going to offer premium customer support. Because I, I do feel like the, the the vibe I've gotten from a lot of accounts and bookkeepers is like they just don't get the support they want from Bill.com. And so there's a – basically, you get fast track access to chat, email, or phone support for prompt personalized assistance. So it looks like they're stepping up their, their game on that, that side as well. And there's another feature specifically for accountants that I really like, which is multiple client bill approval through the accountant console, meaning that I, as an accountant – Log in and on my dashboard, I see I have 100 bills to approve across all 20 clients. And I can click into that and then go through one by one without having to log into each individual company account in bill.com, which is really cool for people who do stuff like business management, who are paying bills for lots of clients every single day, or, or just anyone who does like an accounts payable function across multiple clients in, with bill.com. It's a n- nice feature. Uh, And then they also are expanding cross-border payments. They continue to do that. So now they're at 130 countries and 106 currencies in a new VIP program for qualified accounting firms and clients that conduct high-volume transactions. And it said, the article actually uh, that I have, it says they're going to be at Sage Intact Advantage, which will be at Sage Intact Advantage next week as well. So we'll have to go and check some of these features out. We'll go say hi to the Bill.com team. And if you're going to be at Sage Intact Advantage, come say hi to us. Where are we going to be, David? Um, I, at the MGM Grand. <laughs> That's about <laughs> the, like, I saw the map and I'm like, I don't know where we're going to be. So uh, as we'll tweet it. Follow us on the Twitter and we'll definitely get that out for sure. David's hard to miss in a conference, you know, given his height. And he's wearing a Cloud Accounting Podcast shirt all the time. So it should be easy to track down, I think. Yeah, just look for the red hair. <laughs> That's right. Um, what else is new? Veeam, the payment service, is integrated with Z- Zapier now. This is super, super cool because the examples of what you can do with Veeam and Zapier are really interesting. It's just a few of the possibilities. So basically, not familiar with Zapier, it's a... How would you describe it, David? It's it's a way API to test service. Some digital digital plumbing between apps. So yeah. if app, so if apps don't talk to each other directly, you could possibly make two apps talk to each other through Zapier. Right. So Zapier talks to app A, Zapier talks to app W, and you can actually build yeah. some rules and connect those two apps together. For example, um, you know, your customer signs up on your website. And maybe you want to take their name and address when they sign up on your website and put that into your accounting software you could use a total like Zapier to move that data across. So I have a trigger from a form on my website. It, the action is it creates a contact in my QuickBooks file. Yeah. And so with, with Veeam and Zapier, you can now do cool things like, for example, use the Veeam and Schedule by Zapier's app to set the frequency of your recurring payments and eliminate manual entries. There's You could potentially use Veeam and Salesforce together to automatically send a new payment request when an order is created in Salesforce, send a payment request from Veeam to the customer to pay for that order. You could use the Veeam and Harvest app to make sure um, that when you have a new invoice in Harvest, you send a request with Veeam. Pretty nifty stuff there. And check out the show notes when we've got those done for a list of the triggers and actions, probably the best way to do it. 
Oh, here it is. I found it. So currently the supported triggers, meaning what starts a workflow is an updated inbound payment status or an updated outbound payment status. So if a payment is updated, basically in Veeam, you can trigger something. And then the actions that are supported. So like to using Zapier to make Veeam do something is you can send a payment, create a contact or request a payment. The sending a payment thing is really amazing. Interesting, right? Because you could automate so much with Veeam now, if you've got your you know, contacts in Zero or QuickBooks or NetSuite or Intact, you know, you want to pay them a commission or something like that. And you have some tool that calculates commissions and that's all in like a Google Sheet. You could theoretically connect your Google Sheet to Zapier and pay out all those commissions automatically on a preset schedule or something, right? Like it's just one idea. I feel like it's, and I talked to apps about this before, right? It's sometimes it's hard for you as the app developer to think of, okay, what would, why would we want to connect to, to Zap, Zapier? But it's really like there's use cases that customers want to do or need to do that you can't even think of it or imagine. And so, so yes, you're right. By connecting to Zapier, and I think we talked about Pat's Ignition when they announced how they were connecting to Zapier, right? It opened up 700 other possible combinations of apps that can now do cool stuff. With your and the beauty, the beauty for you as a developer uh, on a small team, especially, is that now you've just built one connection. You may maintain one API connection to Zapier, and your customers can do all this stuff that would have been impossible for you to build before. But so it's not really, a replacement for your own API. I don't know, just for all you developers listening, it's you need to have your own API because Zapier needs to talk to you through your API for starters. Right. But you need to offer a true API and you probably also want to offer Zapier because there's a bunch of people that maybe they have the brains of an engineer because maybe they're an accountant, or they, but they don't know how to code. And that's where Zapier is nice. Yeah. And if you're an accountant, learn to use Zapier because it's pretty cool. You can do a lot of awesome things with it. And then you can offer this service to your clients. Like, let me automate some of these painful things in your business and they will love you for it. And there's great, there's people like Heather Slatterly who like are like, they're training just, people, training, training people how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, what else? Uh, Gus, Gusto has an update with FreshBooks. Speaking of integrations, I think they've always had a payroll integration, but now it works better. It's more visible. So now small business owners can find Gusto in their FreshBooks profile, and then they can set up the integration to automatically book the payroll entries into their FreshBooks account. Interesting. I wonder, because I feel, my impression of FreshBooks has always been kind of that smaller scale, like I'm a one-man shop. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, well, you know, you have a, maybe a few employees and, and you can also pay contractors with Gusto too. So that, you know, if you're a, even if you're a freelancer, maybe you work with a bunch of other freelancers on projects that you run, right. You got to pay them out for their work and stuff. So, and then Slack has an update. They, they just released a workflow builder tool. Speaking of like automation, did you see this one, David? No, not at all. Um, so now instead of having to use Zapier to do some stuff, you can directly create custom workflows in Slack. So the examples given are standardize how you collect requests from your team, report any outage in real time, and get new team members up to speed with welcome messages. Those are just a few examples. Uh, So I'm trying to think if there's anything I really like. The recurring progress updates are pretty cool. Or, you know, fielding requests from your team. Like these are these are kind of like like creating it actually looks a lot like Zapier when you create a workflow. Like here's what happens, here's the, what it collects, here's what it does, does. So like for instance, the example here that I'm looking at right now is a help desk request. So you can create a form inside of Slack that has you know all the information you need for a typical help desk request. And then once it's submitted, it posts the information into a different channel, like maybe for your IT team. So it's like a way to set up some quick like automation without having to go buy another help desk tool or something. No, that's uh, anything that you can automate from the app you're already in, the better. I mean, even uh, QuickBooks is, I think QuickBooks Online has added some sort of like workflowy tools. They've started to experiment around. I think in the QuickBooks lab, you can add to QuickBooks too. So any any little teeny bits of automation you can do yourself adds up, yep. right? And I think we have one last uh, story before we go, right? Yeah, I think it's it really ties into last week, right? Every, a lot of our stories last week were all, everybody's trying to become a bank. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And there, and I've, there's more stories of that. Like uh, Amex is targeting, or actually, sorry, everybody's trying to be a small business bank, right? Um, and now there's other articles this week, like Amex is targeting small businesses. Uh, MasterCard's trying to go out, working with another company to go after um, employees to help them get their paychecks two days early, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and these big, big partnerships. And there's other tech companies that are now entering the uh small business bank credit card account, right? There, a lot of people are doing this. And I think the most notable this week was that I saw a lot on social media was Scale Factor. So Scale Factor now released a credit card for small business. So it's kind of similar to what we talked about last week about Expensify, right? They're mm-hmm. going to be able to control that end-to-end spend. Well, and this is really interesting because Scale Factor is not just software like Expensify. They are an accounting shop that makes yeah. software. They're an accounting firm with engineers, like you like to say. Yeah. And so, and, and I think this is like this going to be the standard. I think last week we even said like, oh, obviously QuickBooks and Zero are going to do this too. Like it's pretty obvious this is all coming. But where this is really kind of heading and tying back to last week is um, we were, I kind of, we t- I think maybe even two weeks ago, we talked about how like there's this partnership, right? Between smaller regional banks and tech companies. And like they kind of need each other. Right, mm-hmm. because a lot of the tech companies can't become a bank, and a lot of these teenier, smaller regional banks really are not good at tech. <laughs> That's an I, understatement, yeah. But I feel like, like, like looking at this and stepping back a little bit, um, there was an op-ed piece about um, how this is not a fad; like it's necessary. These partnerships, um, and it was in Bank Innovation. But really stepping back and thinking about this, I'm starting to wonder, like. I get it. Everybody wants to disrupt Bank of America and Wells Fargo and the big guys, right? And the chases of the world. But I'm starting to wonder if like, maybe there's a reason that little mid-sized, I might say peon bank, but there's a reason that bank is just a teeny little regional mid-sized bank and it hasn't grown past that. And maybe they're just not ready to grow past that. And so now they're pairing up with tech companies that are being over aggressively on their growth. And like, does this just lead to breakdowns? Well, then there was a specific breakdown that happened this week. The mobile only bank chime went down on Wednesday. Like everything broke. You couldn't use this. So this is a one of those challenger banks, right? One of those new app-based banks where there's no branches. And their app went down. Their debit cards weren't working. Their credit cards weren't working. You couldn't pay your bills. St- uh, payments weren't processing. And this is for five million customers. So they are they are a startup, but they've had insanely rapid growth. And major most of it is they market. There's no uh, overdraft fees. So you know, no you, bank so fees at all. No bank fees at all, including or, overdraft. Right. So they gained a ton of customers after Wells Fargo uh, had their problems, and it's unfortunate that this happened. It's the third time they've had an outage in since July or something like that. And they're in the middle of raising a new round of funding from investors, and they're tr- seeking a valuation of five billion dollars. So not not great, right? And, and you figured out, David, that it actually wasn't Chime itself that had the issues; it was a partner that they work with, right? Who was that? Yeah. So remember last week, also we I talked about that that company's name I couldn't pronounce out of Europe, Revolut, Revolut, right? And essentially, they're the same thing. They're a, they're a, a non-bank bank, one of these challenger banks, right? But mm-hmm. they're all powered by the same company. There's a, there's a company called uh, Galileo, and they they power Robinhood, they power Chime, they power all these companies. And that's where the outage level happened. Now, it didn't affect all of the companies that are built on top of this technology stack company that's based out of Salt Lake City in, in Utah. But the the bigger thing, which I was amazed by, is... For 48 hours, Chime was down. I think before we recorded earlier today, I saw Chime might finally be up and 100% operational. Right. But mind you, 5 million people could not buy groceries. People were at restaurants and they couldn't leave the restaurant because the card would not swipe. They could not pay the restaurant tab. Right. Wow. In the meantime, the company that is powering this technology is announcing and releasing their press releases and talking about how great it is that they just raised $77 million. Like, like, like I mean, kind of like... That's like bad what timing. assholes. It's bad timing, yeah. and, it, but, and it's it's yeah. horrible. Their biggest client was down, and they're bragging about how much money they just raised. So Galileo, just to be clear, make sure I understand it, is the payment processor API company on the back end. So you've got here's the stack as I see as I am envisioning it. It is Chime has the app, the app leverages Galileo for the payment processing. And then 
I also learned that Chime isn't the bank, that they partner with Bancorp Bank for the actual banking. So Chime's an app that sits on top of a traditional bank and Galileo for the processing. So Galileo broke and then all of Chime couldn't send any payments, basically couldn't process any payments for its customers. Yeah. The the crazy thing was, and you start reading people's tweets, their direct deposits were going to Chime though, but you couldn't get your money out. So so everybody like that was the only part that was not down. Like so money was going in to Chime, but nobody right. could get money out of Chime. It was like Hotel California. Well, I guess it's a really good thing that it didn't happen that the inbound payments got blocked too, because that would be really bad if like people's paychecks were bouncing out of their accounts. <laughs> that would be that would have been um like my peril HR times a thousand. But this was kind of like that. People saw their paychecks in their right. accounts and they could not access it. Well, it's it's one thing to not be able to like pay your restaurant bill with your Chime credit card, but it would be another thing if like your paycheck, your biweekly paycheck bounced and then you had to spend a week or two trying to get it another one paid into your account, right? From your employer who's like, Why why didn't it work? Because they yeah. don't they don't know why. And in the 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 and just to Full circle this, right? Yeah. Like people on Twitter were really affected. People had their cell phone bills turned off. Like people got affected by this and very personal. They, they, at gas stations, right? Et cetera. They're running out of gas. They can't buy gas. Like, cause they were really, I mean, to some extent, when you're marketing no withdrawals, I'm sorry, no overdraft fees, you're marketing at either the unbanked or people that are already probably living paycheck to paycheck. Right. right. That's the vast majority of their customer base. That's who they're going after. Right. And then their, uh, their founders strongly spoke up about this and, it's just that that tech Uberist, right? Like I completely acknowledge the fact that we feel like we let uh, users down. Like they call them users, they're not customers. Like it's just like this, mm, this yeah, disconnect, right? And yeah. we saw this with the the visor tax stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like like people are really they're truly affected by this stuff, and tech companies have got to get this. They or this is never going to happen. Like this, yeah. people are people. All these people, they're five million people. They got they're going to probably lose four million. And there goes their five billion dollar valuation right off the we'll window. See. We'll have to track it. Yeah, uh, but we got to get going. This yes. is awesome. We'll continue this follow up on all these stories in the weeks to come. In the meantime, David, if people want to connect with you online, where should they do that? Uh, easiest way is on Twitter at David Leary, and I'm at Blake T Oliver. And I'll see you again next week, David. Uh, well, yes, we'll see each other in person next week. And yeah. if you want to see us in person over the next few couple weeks here. We're going to be uh, at Sage Intact Advantage next week. Mm -hmm. uh, following that, we're going to an accounting firm is having their own conference for their own employees, a virtual accounting firm. We're going to be at AcuityCon in Atlanta. Now, I don't think you can really go to that, but hey, you know, we'll be in Atlanta. Then QuickBooks Connect is after that. And at QuickBooks Connect, we're going to be at the Practice Ignition Party. We're going to be oh, at the yeah. uh, VIP Party for Gusto, Routable, and Drab. Um, you said you're going to the Digital CPA Conference in Seattle. Yeah, um, that's so in December. So hit the show notes for all the links to all these events that uh, you can come see us in person at. And then also in the show notes is our merch store that we officially finally launched. And uh, we have sold the shirt today. Somebody yeah, bought a shirt. Thank you so much for buying the shirt. Um, and we have some we limited made, edition shirts that are only going to be available till December 12th. We made $2 in profit from hey, the shirt. This is, a, this is how it's going to go. Yes. <laughs> if you buy a sticker, we make 50 cents in profit. So we should well, we sell two, more $2 in gross profit. I wonder what our net yeah. is going to be on all this. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll figure all right. this out. Hey, until uh, next week, everybody. Bye. All right, bye.